Let me begin in the name of God, who has given us his name in many languages, both in the name of God and Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When, of course, I was assigned to deliver this lecture tonight, the world outwardly was a very different place. And perhaps many of you tonight would have preferred that I speak about the unbelievable turmoil that goes on out in the world about us. But before beginning, let me just repeat the famous Taoist saying that when there is a great storm outside, the sage comes in and tends to his own garden. That's an advice which is very important for those devoted to understanding of matters spiritual in this tumultuous period of our history. The subject assigned for me to open up this very important conference on the relationship between the inner dimensions of Islam and Christianity in its orthodox and eastern form uh, is the question of the heart. And the title which I've chosen for it is a translation really a, a, of a hadith of the Prophet. When I say the Prophet, I mean the Prophet of Islam. The heart of the faithful is the throne of the all merciful. For those who know some Arabic, of course, you know, Qalb al Mu'min Ashur Rahman. The heart is the center of the human macrocosm. At once, the center of the physical body, the vital energies, the emotions, and the soul, as well as the meeting place between the human and the celestial realms where the spirit resides. How remarkable is this reality of the heart, that mysterious center which from the point of view of our earthly existence seems so small, and yet as the Prophet has said, it is the throne of God, the All-Merciful, Ar-Rahman. The throne that encompasses the whole universe. Or as he uttered another saying, my heaven cannot contain me, nor my earth, but the heart of my faithful servant can contain me. It is the heart, the realm of interiority to which Christ referred when he said the kingdom of God is within you. And it is the heart which the founders of all religions and the sacred scriptures advise man to keep pure, of course by man I mean men and women, as condition for his salvation and deliverance. We need only re to recall here the words of the Gospels, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. And yet the supreme reality of the human state is so hidden from us. We have fallen into a such a state that the heart has become a hidden crypt at the center of our being, yet so inaccessible, to the extent that the itinerary of the spiritual life may be said to be none other than the rediscovery of the heart and penetration into it. The doctrine of the centrality of the heart in the human state is universal, as its relation to intellection, sapience, and union. The Bible and the Quran speak often of heart knowledge. In Christianity, already the Desert Fathers articulated the spiritual, mystical, and symbolic meanings of the reality of the heart. And these teachings led to a long tradition in the Eastern Orthodox Church in which the prayer of the heart became central to his chasm, about which we shall hear so much from the greatest authorities these days. The exposition of the significance of the heart and the elaboration of the mysticism and theology of the heart, culminating perhaps with St. Gregory of Palamas. In Catholicism, another development took place in which the heart of the faithful became in a sense replaced by the heart of Christ, and a new spirituality developed on the basis of the devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. Reference to his bleeding heart became common in the writings of St. Figures of St. Bernard de Clairvaux and St. Catherine of Siena. The Christian doctrines of the heart, based as they were on the Bible, present certain universal theses to be also seen in Judaism, the most important of which is the association of the heart with the inner soul of man and the center of the human state. In Jewish mysticism, the spirituality of the heart was further developed, and to some Jewish mystics, uh, and some Jewish mystics emphasized the idea of the broken or contrite heart. Uh, Levnichbar in Hebrew, and wrote that to reach the divine majesty, 
one had to tear one's heart and that the broken heart mentioned in the Psalms sufficed for deliverance. To make clear the universality of the spiritual significance of the heart across religious boundaries, which while also emphasizing the development of theology of the heart and methods of the prayer of the heart, particular to each tradition, one need only to recall that the name of Horus, the Egyptian god, meant heart of the world. In Sanskrit, the term for heart, radaya, also means the center of the world, since by virtues of the, virtue of the analogy existing between the ma macrocosm and the macrocosm, the center of man is also the center of the universe. Furthermore, in Sanskrit, the term shrata, meaning faith, also means knowledge of the heart, as in Arabic, where the word iman means faith when used for man and knowledge when used for God, as in the divine name al-mu'min. As for the Chinese tradition, in Chinese the term shin means both heart and mind consciousness. One could go on almost indefinitely to point out the remarkable universal doctrine of the meaning of the heart as both the center which relates man to the spiritual world and to higher levels of a being and also inner knowledge which makes access to those levels and finally to the divine abode possible. There are moreover specific developments of the doctrine of the heart which are, are related to the particular characteristics of the religion in question, as one sees clear in the case of Christianity, where in fact more than one tradition dealing with this subject, namely the Orthodox and the Catholic, not to speak of the special case of San Juan de la Cruz, and I use his name especially in Spanish because the San Juan de la Cruz is somewhat different from the John of the Cross, who develops the theology and mission of the heart very similar to that of Islam. In any case, our goal here has been to point out briefly to the significance of the heart and the theology and spiritual practices related to it on a global scale and across religious boundaries before turning to the Islamic tradition with which we shall be particularly concerned. There's a vast literature in Islam dealing with the heart and its intellectual and spiritual significance. Already in the Quran, there are over 130 references to the heart in Arabic qalb, plural qulub, and numerous traditions of the Prophet also refer to this central subject. Likewise, there is hardly a Sufi treatise that does not refer to the heart, or what Sufis call matters pertaining to the heart, al-umur al-qalbiyya. One often finds titles of Islamic metaphysical and spiritual writings containing the term heart such as Qutul Qulub, Nourishment for Hearts, a book on Sufism. Shifa al Qulub, Healing of Hearts, a book dealing with metaphysics. And Nur al Fuad, Light of the Inner Heart, dealing with Ishraqi or Illuminationistic cosmology and metaphysics. Moreover, there is not one but a series of terms in referring to heart on various levels of its reality, including besides the word Qalb. Fuad, Ser, and Lob, not to mention the Persian Del. Unfortunately to an audience which does not necessarily know Islamic languages, it is, I have to be very careful not to emphasize too much the linguistic element of what is involved, but the terminology used in a sacred language are ex is extremely significant for bringing out the inner meaning, and especially the word Qalb, Q-A-L-B, in Arabic, which is the most common word for the heart. We shall get to some of its meanings later. To delineate the Islamic understanding of the heart on both a metaphysical and an operative level, it is best to start with a basic term in Arabic for heart, namely qalb, Q-A-L-B. The root meaning of this term means change and transformation. The term inqalab, which is used in modern Persian as a translation for the European concept of revolution, meant originally a change of state. One of the names of God is in fact muqallabul qulub, all from the root of the word qalb, heart, that is transformer of hearts. And Ibn Arabi uses the term taqallub from the same root, derived from the root Q-A-L-B, as meaning the constant transformative power inherent in the heart, a power which brings about integration in a dynamic mode. The root Q-L-B also means to turn upside down, the root for the word qalb. The heart on its corporeal level is in a sense suspended upside down, its traditional sim symbol being an inverted triangle, 
which both Titus Burkhardt and Ronet Genon have referred often in their writings. It has also the root meaning of mold, mold, the Arabic word for mold being qalib, again from the same root. That is what holds the inner reality of man together. There is here also an inversion of the positive and negative elements, since the heart is moreover the ismath, the intermediate state, the barzakh, and principle of the macrocosmic domain. The mutation of the root QBL, carried out often in traditional Islamic science of Jaff, a QLB gives QBL, which is the root of the word Qibla, or point to which one orients oneself during the daily canonical prayers. The Qibla, the direction of Mecca, being the direction pointing uh, to where the all-merciful resides, that is the house of God. That is why Rumi, in reference to this inner identification between the heart and the Kaaba, the Qalb and the Qibla, which is an inversion of the same root, uh, which is also the supreme goal of pilgrimage, sings in a very famous verse, O people who have gone to pilgrimage, where are you? Where are you? The beloved is here. Come here, come here. There is beloved within the heart. The term of the Kaaba of the heart, or Kaaba Yadil in Persian, is very commonly used in Sufi literature. The root QBL also possesses the meaning of acceptance and receptivity, which are basic characteristics of the heart. The Qalb is receiving evermore the theophanies which reach it from above and within, and it possesses not only the power of transformation or taqallub, but also receptivity or qabul. It is to this reality that Ibn Arabi refers in his famous poem, in his interpreter of desire, Tajuman al-Ashwaq, when he says, my heart is capable of taking on any form, the famous verse which all of you know and to which I will return later. But it's interesting in the Arabic, لَقَدْ سَارَ قَلْبِي قَابِلًا لِكُلِّ سُورَةً it uses the term both qalb for heart and qabil and receptivity. So that the very root term of heart is also receptivity of the divine realities. As far as Quranic references to the heart is concerned, one finds in them a number of important characteristics associated with it. Characteristics that are often repeated throughout the Quran and which have correspondences in other religions and especially in Christianity. The Quran, like other sacred scriptures, associates knowledge and, and understanding with the heart, and the blindness of the heart with loss of understanding. As, for example, when God asserts after complaining of man's not learning the appropriate lessons from early er, sacred history, and here I quote from the Quran, for indeed it is not the eyes that grow blind, but it is the hearts which are within the bosoms that grow blind. This blindness of the heart, so characteristics of fallen man, is also described by the Quran as a hardening of the heart. Again, I quote, but their heart, hearts were hardened, and the devil made all that they used to do seem unfair to them. Also, again, the quotation, woe unto those whose hearts are hardened against remembrance of God, Allah, such are in plain error. Furthermore, the Quran identifies this hardening of the heart with a veil that God has cast over the heart of those who have turned away from the truth. I quote, we have placed upon their hearts veils, lest they should understand and in their ears a deafness. Also, and we place upon their hearts veils, lest they should understand it and in their ears a deafness. The heart can, however, be softened and the veil removed with the help of God himself, with knowledge of our hearts. For Allah knoweth what is in your hearts, and he knew what was in their hearts, another quotation. This melting or softening of the hardened heart can be achieved only with God's help through what he has revealed in his sacred scriptures and the grace that emanates from revelation. And I quote, Allah had now revealed the fairest of statements, a scripture consistent, so that their flesh and their hearts soften to Allah's reminder. Again, Allah. God wants man's heart to be at peace and rest. And although from one point of view, God as the Rahman resides in the heart of the faithful, from another point of view, he comes between man and his heart. And I quote, Allah cometh in between man and his own heart. And it is only with the help of God 
that fallen man can gain access to his own heart. It is in this context that the famous Sufi description of the spiritual path as a tahliya or emptying of the heart, tahliya or embellishing of the heart, and tajliya or making it ready to receive theophanies from God must be understood. Once one turns to God for help, he provides man with the possibility of having tranquility and peace in his heart. I quote, Allah appointed it as good tidings and that your hearts thereby might be addressed. Verily in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. A verse which relates peace and rest to the heart directly of the heart directly to dhikr or quintessential prayer. This verse serving as the scriptural basis for invocation or quintessential prayer in Islam in its relation to the heart. When God softens the heart and removes its veils, then the heart becomes worthy of being the receptacle of the divine peace, or al-sakina. For as the Quran says, he it is who sent down peace of reassurance, al-sakina, into the hearts of believers. On the basis of these Quranic teachings and the sunnah, that is the wants and hadith tradition of the Prophet, which serve as the first and most authoritative commentaries upon the word of God, Islamic sages developed an elaborate doctrine, at once metaphysical, cosmological, and anthropolog anthropological in the traditional sense of these terms concerning the heart. They also continued and elaborated operative methods received from the Prophet and his earliest spiritual inheritors, involving various modes of prayer and means of reaching and penetrating the heart. The answer to the question, what is the heart, is almost inexhaustible but at least some of the major features of it can be mentioned here. The heart is first of all the center of our being on all the different levels of our existence. Not only the corporeal and the emotive, but also the intellectual and the spiritual. It is what connects the individual to the supra-individual realms of being. It is, if in modern society, if in modern society heart knowledge is rejected, it is because modernism refuses to see man beyond his individual level of existence. The heart is not a center of our being, it is the supreme center. Its uniqueness resulting from the metaphysical principle that for any specific realm of manifestation, there must exist a principle of unity to be found in the principle of that order itself. The heart is the barzakh or ismath between this world and the next between the visible and the invisible worlds, between the human realm and the realm of the spirit, between the horizontal and vertical dimensions of existence. In the same way that the vertical and horizontal lines of the cross, itself the symbol of not only Christ and Christianity, but also the universal man al-insan al-kamil in Islam, meet at only one point. There can only be one heart for each human being, although the single reality partakes of gradations and levels of reality. The heart is then our unique center, the place where the supreme access penetrates our macrocosmic existence, the place where the all-merciful name of God resides, and also the locus for the breath of God, hence the profound relation that exists between incantatory prayers carried out with the breath and the heart. The heart is also a mirror which must be polished by invocation according to the well-known hadith for everything there is a mirror the polish of the heart for the heart is invocation for everything there is a polish excuse me the polish for the heart is invocation once this act of polishing has been carried out the heart becomes the locus for the direct manifestations of God's names and qualities the heart in fact is the locus par excellence for the theophanies which descend one after another upon it. This constant change in reflection of ever new divine manifestations is in fact related to the root meaning of qalb to which I've already alluded. It might of course be asked if the nature of the qalb, of the heart, is to be in constant transformation, what is permanent in the heart? And how can the heart be at peace and rest? The answer is the quality uh, itself of being a mirror. What is permanent in our not is our nothingness before God, or in other words, becoming a perfect mirror, which being nothing in itself is able to reflect perfectly 
forms emanating from above. The peace of the heart is precisely a total surrender to God, not only on the level of the will, but also on the level of existence. To become nothing before God is to be at once nothing and everything. Nothing at the surface of a mirror and everything in reflecting the, the never-ending theophanies issuing from the hidden treasury of God, which according to the Quran is inexhaustible. Once the heart is softened and is polished, it may be described not only as a mirror, but also as an eye, which has opened up and now can see the invisible realm as the external eyes are able to see the external world. The symbol of the eye of the heart, the Ayn al-Qalb in Arabic or Cheshmet Del in Persian, the title of one of the most famous books, Afraid of Shuan, is not confined to Islam, but is universal. As we see in Plato's expression, eye of the soul, St. Augustine's Oculus Cordis, or the third eye of Hindu and Buddhist doctrines, but especially emphasized in Sufism. The reason that the symbol of vision is used rather than the other senses is that vision has an objective real character and therefore better symbolizes the function of the heart intellect than do other senses. Nevertheless, the heart also does have other inner faculties. With the ear of the heart, man can hear the silent music to which Plato, of which Plato spoke. And with the olfactory faculty of the heart, man can smell the perfumes of paradise. But it is the eye of the heart that is of central importance. The eye of the heart, which is none other than the eminent intellect, is the faculty with which we are able to see the invisible world and ultimately God. But it is also the eye with which God sees us. When we are cordial with God, cordial, how do with cordial with the heart? When we are cordial with God, God is cordial with us. Although principally the relation is reversed. Only when God loves us can we love God. The heart has al also has a face that has, has turned to each world, what's called watchful qalb in Arabic. And the face that it turns to God is none other than the face that God turns to man. That is why to seek to efface the divine reality from man's consciousness, as modern agnosticism and secularism seek to achieve, is ultimately to the effacing of man himself and his reduction to the subhuman. <coughs> At the center of the heart resides what in Arabic is called Fuad, F-U, Glaustav, A-D. That is what the heart center, in which two eyes, one meant to see God and the other see the to see the world are united in one. In contrast to the external eyes which are, are two in number and see multiplicity, the inner eye of the heart is one but is able to perceive both worlds. It therefore has the integrating power of unifying multiplicity and unity. He whose eye of the heart has opened is able not only to see the one, but also to contemplate the one in the many and the many in the one. Therefore achieving unity or tawheed, the ideal goal of Islam in its highest sense. Let's not forget the importance of the heart for faith and divine love it must also be mentioned that first of all according to the Quran and Hadith real faith al-Iman is associated with the heart and not with the mind or the tongue alone to really believe we must believe in our heart where faith resides secondly the heart is not only the seat of human love but also of divine love the fire of love burns in the heart and is there that one finds it uh, to lead us to the in beloved, the capital B, that is God is the beloved. The heart of the saint is the source of a light resulting from his in inner illumination and a warmth which issues from that the fire of love of God. Knowledge and love at this level are united in single reality, like the light and heat of a fire, the locus of this sacred fire being the heart. Although the heart is a single reality, it partakes of many levels, as do the knowledge and love of God. Many Sufi masters, such as Rumi, Attar, Abul Hassan al Nuri, Hussein al Nuri, have referred to the seven levels of the heart, to which various technical terms have been given. Hakim Termidhi, a 4th century, 11th century Sufi, goes a step further to identify these levels with concentric castles of the soul, each with its own covering 
that defends the innermost heart and provides inner protection for the interior fortified castles, which can be penetrated only after great spiritual effort. As has been shown by the famous scholar of, of the subject, Lucille Lopat Baralt, the schema is very similar to that of St. Teresa of Avila in her description of her interior castles, and we find the idea of concentric hearts made of fortified dwellings protected by walls in both of these sources. These correspondences reveal both historical influences and morphological resemblances, but above, above all, they point to universal teachings of the Philosophia Perennis, or the Religio Perennis concerning the heart, and levels of its existence corresponding to levels of microcosmic reality. Returning to the word qalb, Q-A-L-B, the word for the heart, it is possible to point to another aspect of the reality of the heart by analyzing the Arabic term closely related to qalb, namely qalib, which means the well, from the same root again, Q-A-L-I-B this time. The heart is the well from which gushes forth the fountain of life, and also the knowledge and love which save. In Islam, water is the most direct symbol of God's mercy and compassion. It might be said that since the compassionate resides in the heart of the faithful, once the veil of the heart is lifted, the water from the well of the heart gushes forth in correspondence to the outward flow of thy divine compassion and mercy, one of whose most direct symbols in this world is water. That is why in the language of Hadith, the saints of the Prophet, the heart is sometimes referred to as the source or spring of wisdom, Yanbu al-Hikmah. According to a very famous hadith, which is foundational of the practice of a spiritual retreat in Sufism, and which is found in many different sources, it is said, one who purifies himself for God, that is, makes a spiritual retreat, for 40 days, God makes a spring of wisdom, al-Hikmah, to gush forth from his heart to his tongue. This hadith also links spiritual practice directly to the means of access to the heart and indicates the way to remove the rust or crust from the heart so as to allow what one could call the water of the wisdom of wisdom to flow from the heart to the tongue. If the heart is the reality described here, then all one would need to do in order to have spiritual realization would be to penetrate into the heart. The problem for us is that for the human being marked by the fall, the heart is no longer easily accessible, although it is the center of our being. For the man of the golden age, or in the Edenic state, those who lived in the primordial condition of what Islam calls the fetra, the heart was directly accessible. They lived in the heart, that is with God and in God, but through a series of falls, the heart became ever more inaccessible covered by a hardened shell which symbolizes powerful psychological forces. Long before modern times, the heart had already become the crypt and also the cave to be found and penetrated only after heroic effort in order to gain knowledge of the mysteries which resides in the heart cave. The symbolism of the heart as cave hidden within the breast of man is in fact universal. In the context of Islam, the Prophet taking refuge with Abu Bakr, his close friend and companion, in a cave on their way from Mecca to Medina in that journey which is called the Hijra, or migration, was understood by Sufis not only to mean an external historical event, but also to signify the trans-historical and meta-individual reality of the heart where the friend resides. It is in direct allu allusion to this truth that again, I quote Rumi in one of his ghazals, he says, consider this breast as the cave, the spiritual retreat of the friend. Friend always means God, the spiritual with the capital F. If thou art the companion of the cave, enter the cave, enter the cave. In sinara chun qardan khalvat gehe an yardan gar yar qari to yaqim dar qar sho dar qar sho. There must be two or three people in the audience who understand Persian besides Professor Chidik. So this is this is Professor Chidik. I don't know where he's sitting. Uh, uh, but how does one enter the cave? Besides, I have to sing uh, once quote once when I quote uh, Rumi in Persian. Other people would think he was from University of Georgia and Athens. Uh, but as how. 
But how does one enter the cave made inaccessible to fallen man? The answer resides in the reality of God as the compassionate, whose throne is the heart. God, through his qualities of compassion and mercy, has sent revelation, which provides the means of access to the heart. To accept a revelation means, first of all, to possess faith, which resides in the heart. Faith is the necessary element for participation in the revelation and the condition necessary for the efficacy of the means provided by it to save man and to the open the door to the inner kingdom. But to penetrate into the heart as the center of our being, must also, we must also take recourse to the spiritual practices sanctioned and made efficacious by tradition. At the heart of these practices, as far as Islam is concerned, stands quintessential prayer or invocation, a dhikr, which is ultimately the prayer of the heart. Invocation sanctified by God himself, combined with meditation needed to concentrate the mind and to overcome its dispersing effects, is like an arrow which penetrates directly the heart. On a more operative level, one could say that the soul of the invoker, advaker, enwrapped as it is in the dhikr, is itself the arrow released by the hands of the master archer or the spiritual teacher towards the target, which is the heart. As for the power which allows the arrow to travel towards the target and finally to penetrate it, it is the initiatic power, what is called walaya or walaya in Arabic, without which the arrow would not be able to travel. That is why the practice of spiritual techniques made available by revelation are invalid unless they are carried out in the matrix of an orthodox religion and through the regularity of spiritual and initiatic transmission. Without orthodoxy and tradition, no one can overcome the obstacles which had once hide the heart and protect it from demonic forces. Without them, there would be no power or force to propel the arrow towards its target. The practice of spiritual techniques made available to those qualified by the tradition requires ample preparation of both a doctoral, doctrinal and a practical nature. More specifically, it requires the attainment of spiritual virtues, without which man has no right to penetrate the heart center. And this attainment implies not only thinking about the virtues and speaking about them, but above all, being the virtues. For the virtues, which ultimately belong to God, are the manner in which we participate in the sacred. The question of whether the spiritual practices made us, make us virtuous or virtues are necessary for spiritual practices is a complicated one with which we cannot deal here. As far as the heart is concerned, suffice it to say that to enter the heart as the spiritual center of our being, which is pure, one must oneself be pure and worthy of the sacred abode into which one is entering. One might object that the heart of man is not always pure. The use of the term heart in the ordinary sense certainly warrants such an observation. But this ordinary understanding of the heart, which is available to us all, is not the same as the meaning of the heart in its spiritual sense, where the compassionate, with the capital C, that is God, is to be found. Nevertheless, the two are not totally unrelated. That is why the prophet calls vek the polish of the heart, meaning, of course, the heart which is covered by rust, not that inner heart or throne, which having never been rusty, does not need to be polished. In any case, as far as the spiritual life is concerned, it is essential not only to polish or to purify the heart, but also to keep it pure, to protect it from all defilement, what is called hefz al-qalb in Sufism. In Sufism, where the heart is compared to the Kaaba, the house of God, it has been said that the heart of fallen man is like the Kaaba before the coming of Islam, when it was full of idols. When the Prophet entered Mecca triumphantly, he first went to the Kaaba and asked Ali ibn Abi Talib and Bilal al-Habashi, two of his companions, to break all the idols therein and to purify the house of God built by Adam and rebuilt by Ab Abraham to honor the one God. Through initiation and spiritual practice, the person who aspires to reach God must break all the idols in his heart and sweep away everything in it so that God alone can be present therein. God is one and therefore does not manifest his presence where there are idols. Alas, the hearts of how many of even believers is like the Kaaba during the age of ignorance 
al jahiliyyah that is before Islam, full of all kinds of idols. Those who seek to follow the spiritual path in Sufism are taught at the time of initiation and embarking upon the path that they must preserve their heart for God alone. For he alone is the master of the house of the heart. God alone is the master of the house of the heart. As a famous Arabic poem says in response to someone knocking on the door of a Sufi's heart, uh, the answer comes from the inside. Laysa fi dar khayrahu dayyar. That is, there is no one in the house except the master of the house. The inner heart of man is itself the supreme name of God. By virtue of the mystery of the creation of man as a being at whose center resides the all-merciful. That is why it is said in Islam that the saints are themselves the names of God. Uh, and who, whose heart is the theater of all of God's names and qualities. The invocation is the sacred means for the realization and actualization of this truth. The human microcosm is created in such a way that it can transform sound into light in the sense that the invocation performed by the tongue becomes ultimately transformed into light in the heart. Human speech in the form of prayer becomes the vision of the eye of the heart. He who invokes with sincerity, persistence, fervor, and total faith in God becomes the possessor of an illuminated heart. More exactly, he is able to break away, thanks to the deck, the crust that veils the light of the inner heart, which is luminous by its own nature. Once this inner light is unveiled, it then shines forth throughout the whole being of man, since the heart is the supreme center of our being. Ultimately, the dhikr is itself the heart, spiritually understood. Invocation as practiced in Sufism is at, high, at the highest level the prayer of the heart and by the heart. The spiritual itinerary of the Sufi is to penetrate the heart with the help of the invocation and finally to realize the identity of the two. It is not only to pray, but also to become prayer, to live at the heart center, and to experience and to know all things from that center. To know from the center is also to be able to go beyond the form to the formless. For the heart is not only the center, but also the abode of spiritual meaning, what Rumi calls ma'ana, transcending the external form, the surah. The person who has reached the heart in a spiritual sense is also able to see the heart of things, especially sacred forms, and to realize their inner unity. He is able to attest to what Friedrich Schoen, who spoke so eloquently from the heart center, has called the transcendent unity of religions, which from the point of view of the heart could also be called the imminent unity of religions, but an imminence which is also transcendence. Sufis have also often spoken of the religion of the heart to which Yuan has referred as religio cordis. Far from being a separate religion, the religion of the heart refers to the essential and superformal reality which lies at the heart of all orthodox religions and which can be reached only through the orthodox and traditional religions. It was to this religio cordis to which Rumi referred again in another one of his poems when he said, the creed of love is separate from all religions. The creed of the religion of the lovers of God is God Himself. Milat Eshka Samid Din Hajudast Ashikandra Milaton Masab Kudas. Furthermore, being open to the reception of theophanies and residing at the same time in the level of the formless, the heart once cleansed becomes the theater for the manifestation of different sacred forms. And the Gnostic, Gnostic is able, or Gnostic is able to discern through his heart knowledge the inner unity of sacred forms, while being also aware of their outward differences and the inviolability of the sacred forms. The famous poem of an Arabi to which allusion was made above and which has been quoted so often recapitulates in verses of haunting beauty these truths. And this is Michael Sell's wonderful translation Wonder a garden among the flames. My heart can take on any form. A meadow for gazelles, a cloister for monks. For the idols, sacred ground. Kaaba for the circling pilgrim. The tables of the Torah, the scrolls of the Quran. My creed is love whenever its caravan turns along the way. That is my belief, my faith. 
through quintessential prayer in the framework of an orthodox tradition, one reaches the inner heart where God is the compassionate, the merciful resides. And by penetration into the heart center, man moves beyond the realm of outwardness and the realm of the individual existence of individual existence to reach the abode of inwardness and the universal order. In that state, his heart becomes the eye with which he sees God. He sees God and also the eye with which God sees him. In that presence, he is nothing in himself, a separate existence. He is but a mirror whose surface is nothing yet reflects everything. In the heart, the spiritual man lives in intimacy with God and with the origin of all those theophanies whose outward manifestations constitute all the beauty that is reflected in the world around us. He lives in that inner garden, that inner paradise, constantly aware, aware of the ubiquitous gardener. On the highest level of realization, man becomes aware that all theophanies are nothing but the source of those theophanies, that the house itself is nothing but the reflection of the master of the house, that there is in fact but one reality, which through its infinite manifestations and reflections upon the mirror of cosmic existence has brought about all that appears to us as multiplicity and otherness and all the apparent distinctions between I and thou, he and they, we and you. At the center of the heart, there is but one reality above and beyond all forms. It was to this reality far beyond the individual manifestations that Mansurah Hallaj was referring in his famous uh, poem when he sang, I saw my God, my Lord, with the eyes of the heart. I asked him, who art thou? He said, thou. رأيت ربي بعين قلبي فقلت من أنت فقال أنت Happy is the man who can open the eyes of his heart with aid of heaven before his earthly eyes become shut at the moment of death and who is able to see the countenance of the beloved while still possessing the precious gift of human life. Thank you. Professor Nasser has uh, agreed to take questions from the audience for a few minutes, and he will uh, field those questions himself. So please, feel free to ask questions. When an audience does not ask questions, I mean, either they've understood everything or nothing, like that. <laughs> it's like that mirror of the heart, so. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, the word qalb is the root is QLB, but its mutation in the traditional science of letters, the gematria that we have in Arabic, will become QBL, which is uh, the same root as the word for the Kabbalah. Yes, Kabbalah in Arabic. Yes, like the word qibla in Arabic, which are is, uh, Kabbalah, the same root as the direction of the prayer in, in Islam, the qibla. Yes. Sir. I heard it correctly. You said that one in Sufism could understand and receive the theophanies from God. My understanding is that in Islam you cannot know anything but the will of God. So what would be the theophanies that one would receive? Who said that, that in Islam can only know the will of God? But I'm saying my understanding is Islam. That's not correct. <coughs> could you correct me on this? Yes. Uh, that is unbelievable because the Quran makes it very, very specific that inviting people to even uh, meditate upon the, God's creation in order to understand his wisdom. Uh, man knows the will of God through the Sharia, but one must try to come to understand the wisdom of God and the nature of God through both his creation and through the knowledge that is revealed through the Quran and through metaphysics, through Hakmah. So uh, the theophanies 
are both realities and, and knowledge. Theophany is really, in the language of Sufism, what constitutes reality itself. Uh, so when you say theophany, there's a divine manifestation in the heart. And that is not only on the level of the will, it's on the level of being. Yes, ma'am. That's a very good, I hope everyone understood the question. She said, can you ma briefly comment upon the eschatology of Islam? It's like, could you briefly read the war and peace in five minutes? But, what's <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she did ask an important question. If the eye of the heart does not open in this life, are we condemned never to have a vision of God? It's a very pertinent, important question. Uh, of course, a very extensive discussion in Islam, as there is in Christianity, as there is in Hinduism, the different views on these complexities of eschatological realities. But uh, at the heart of Islamic teaching, the Islamic metaphysics, uh, you have really three categories of human beings, as mentioned in the Quran. Uh, people of the left hand, people of the right hand, and those who go before in Surah Al-Waqa. And Fir of Shon has had a very beautiful article written on this, he has written a very beautiful article on this subject, which you can consult, in which it goes to the complexities of this. Uh, there are people who are deprived uh, from the paradisal state by the fact that they deny God, they, they deny God in this world, when in Christian language they are people who are condemned to hell. There are those who have not denied God, but the eyes of their hearts have not opened. They're not, they're not directly mystics. And depending on what kind of life they've li lived in this world, they can go to all the different kinds of purgatories or paradise. And then those whose eyes, the eye of the heart is opened. And in a sense, they're already in paradise in this world. That is the virtuous who go to paradise, in a sense, want to do what the Sufis do in this world. That is to have the beatific vision. Now, there is one difference between the Sufi Islamic perspective and uh, at least the central line of Catholic theology, namely the question of the possibility of beatific vision, which as Orthodox Catholic theology denies in this life, and which Sufism does not. Yes? Louder, please, everybody hears you. The question is asking is to what extent did the Sufis consider the heart to be the interiorization of the Kaaba? Uh, they didn't consider it. This is a, uh, a metaphysical and cosmological reality. Uh, the Kaaba is the center of the Islamic universe. It is the house of God. And people make pilgrimage to it and circum circumambulate around it and very few people are able to penetrate into its center. That is to go inside the Kaaba. I've had this great honor in my life, but it's a very rare thing. Now, if you, all those statements that I made microcosmically pertain to the heart, if you understand it from the Sufi point of view. The heart is the center of the human microcosm. It is the house of God on the basis of the hadith, which is the title of my paper tonight. And all of the various forces, emotive, will, psychological, mental, in a sense, revolve around the heart, the heart center, without being able to penetrate into it, except the very few. So the comparison between the heart and the Kaaba was not a kind of contrived literary device by Sufi authors. It had a very profound uh, metaphysical significance. And those who performed the Hajj, the external Hajj, which is incumbent upon Muslims who can do it, and who are given to the spiritual path, uh, the experience, the experience of the Hajj as also interiorization and a penetration to the center of their being. I mean, there are many things of this kind which I cannot speak to in, about in public, but the correspondence is not really just literary. Let's put it at that. Yes, back there. Uh, 
Could, after the, I didn't hear the second part of your question. Why veils on the heart and then what? This is a very good question because you might ask the question, why does God put a veil on our heart and then expect us to remove the veil? Why don't he just give us a heart without veil so we don't have to do anything? And uh, <laughs> It's a very good question. Uh, of course, the answer to this is a metaphysical answer. And first of all, it lies in the mystery of creation itself. Why did, bother, did God bother to create us? Because of course, creation implies a separation. And what the question of the veil that we speak about is the same thing as a separation from God. Creation means separation. Because creation is already separated from the divine principle. Now, uh, the language that the Quran uses in those particular verses is to show you that these veils are not psychological, are not subjective. They're part of the objective created order. And so when you say God does, it means that it's not just women fancy. It is a reality which we have to confront. Not that God on purpose has put obstacles before us so that we can overcome them. Uh, that, it doesn't mean that. Uh, let's see. Yes, and I'll come to you. Y yes, yes. Let me repeat your question so everybody will understand. It's a very important question. She said, is the priority in life to penetrate into one's own heart or into the heart of others? Or is there a relation between the two? Uh, the answer is that you can never penetrate in the heart of anyone else unless you penetrate into your own heart. No one can do good unless he is good or she is good. Uh, one of the great errors of modernism in contrast with perspective, which are people like us hold the traditional point of view, is to want to do good without being good. Uh, in order to penetrate in the heart of others, you have to be, have penetrate into your own heart. There's a Persian saying that so is the, a, a word that rises from the heart penetrates the heart. But how do you make a word rise from the heart? How can I speak from the heart to you so it penetrates your heart unless I myself am in, in my own center? So there's a priority definitely a hierarchy uh, and if it's someone's vocation is to also to penetrate to the heart of others he or she must first penetrate into his or own heart there's no way I said doing good without being good sir yes I said that uh, at least in the formulation of St. Thomas Aquinas the beatific vision in its fullness is preserved for after death. It's not possible in this life. All it was debated by many people, and some Christian mystics got into trouble over that, as you know better than I do. I said, yes, yes. I, in, when I use the word Catholic, I, did, uh, I mean Western Catholic. Otherwise, Islam is also Catholic, Hinduism is Catholic, I mean, it's the universal. I mean, the specific Western Catholic tradition. Of course, the Orthodox tradition is also Catholic in the deepest sense of the term. Uh, gentleman there, yes? No, I, uh, that is not the correct understanding of it, unless if I've not explained it well, it's my fault. But I think I, uh, the two do not contradict each other. Uh, the heart is where man meets God. And where man is really himself, because man was created in the image of God in the Christian sense, and we have Islamic version of it, God created man upon his form that is there. Uh, on the basis of the divine names and qualities. Uh, God has no external form, but form here means God's names and qualities. So uh, to be fully ourselves in, a, in the primordial state in which God created us, in a sense, is to be at the heart center. But we are not there. We are not there. 
because of the fall, of the series of falls. And we are now, uh, we don't have direct access to our heart. But nevertheless, God still resides on that heart center. That uh, supreme center is still within us. We just, the door is closed to us. But also God comes between man and that heart because in two ways. First of all, God has put these obstacles in order to test us. It's been our destiny to live in this age rather than the golden age when we ever looked at a tree, we saw the tree of paradise. Now we have to work on it. We have to work spiritually on ourselves to be able to achieve this. Also, God is the way of access to the heart. So God becomes between man and his heart. means that there is no line of access to the heart except through God. This verse nullifies all modernistic and sort of uh, this new religious and religion movements in which uh, you can reach God by yourself by reading a few books you buy at some borders bookshop in the metaphysical section and <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work uh, the gentleman way back or lady way back there I cannot see fully the lady back there I'm sorry I, I, I can't hear you Professor Katzinger, you have to invite me again to give an answer to <laughs> some other time. <laughs> I'll give you a very brief answer. If all of the human beings on the earth today, whether they're Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jewish, whatever they are, or agnostics, lived at the heart center, they would always see everything from the center. But we don't live in that center. Human beings today live mostly at the periphery of their own existence. And let me say this, it's very important to understand, it is m modern civilization, modernity, and this philosophical dimension, which is mo modernism, which first systematically pushed man away from the heart center, in which people made jokes at the, ha at the heart being the seat of knowledge. It's always the brain is the seat of knowledge, the Bible and the Quran don't know what they're talking about. You must have read about these things in books of philosophy. Now, the, it, modernism pushed man away from his heart center. And the reaction it caused among religions, which is the other side of the coin, is an interpretation of religion moved away from the heart center, which is what is called fundamentalism today in, in all the religions of the world. And the stronger the religions, the stronger the, the reaction. Fundamentalism is a reaction to modernism, the two sides of the same coin. They must be distinguished from the traditional understandings of religion. Whether you have Orthodox Judaism, Fundamental Judaism, Orthodox Islam, Fundamental Islam, Orthodox Christianity, Fundamentalist Christianity, or Hinduism, which is having a very big wave of Hindu fundamentalism, to, must be distinguished from traditional Orthodox Hinduism. Now, uh, that heart is a very important issue in this matter. Uh, that is, uh, these religions were suddenly confronted with the challenge of a worldview which denied the center of man. It was a view of man without a center. And uh, therefore the denial of the heart center, of heart knowledge. And the response to it was the interpretation of their own religion also removed from the center, speaking from the cross, from the element of outwardness. And of course, in the le level of outward forms, opposition is always present. And there can be no harmony except in the inner form. One of the most remarkable statements made by Friedrich Schwann, who's written so well about this, better than any other person, he said there is no accord among religions on, in the human atmosphere. The only accord is possible in the divine stratosphere. Now, modernism cut man off from the divine stratosphere. And so what remained is externally mutually exclusive forms. If all the Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists well, like all these great saints we read about, we would live in a very different world. Uh, next question from back there. Yes, sir.
you, yeah, you come outside the door, I'll teach you how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this, <laughs> this, uh, this is a question I just will answer in this way. Uh, you can stand all of your life by pool of water and discuss how can one jump into the pool and swim without the heavy body sinking to the water bottom. You'll never find that until you jump in. But there is a way. There is a way. God has made possible a way. There's no human situation in which God has prevented man from remembering God. I mean the statement that I made. There's no human situation that is possible in which God has made it impossible for man to remember him. So uh, all the other excuses are from our side. I'll answer one more question. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, equally common, and Western scholarship has paid much less attention to Shiite forms of Sufism. Just recently now, Professor Lewis and one or two other English scholars have written some articles, but by and large, the classical scholars, including the great Louis Massignon, Anna Maria Schimmel, people like that, spend most of their effort in the discussion of the great Sunni orders, and some of the Sunni orders also cut into Shiite, the Shiite world, they're mutual, some are, are different orders, but the phenomenon is to be found in both worlds. Also, opposition to Sufism is to be found in both worlds. But they're not identical. For example, there's nothing in the Shiite world corresponding to the Salafi, Wahhabi interpretation, about which everybody speaks now, which came up in the Islamic world in the 18th, from the 18th century onward. But there are other strands. So it's a rather complicated issue, but the answer would be yes. There are Shiite orders in today's Iran. There are several very important Shiite Sufi orders, as there are in Egypt, Syria, which are predominantly Sunni countries. Yes? In the very, very early period, before the Sufi orders became organized, you might say, before the time of Junaid, the 9th century great Baghdadi Sufi who was buried outside of Baghdad, before that, uh, Shiism and Sufism were very close together. Sometimes it's very difficult to uh, distinguish one ambience from the other. As Shiism became more and more a political, social body, then it became distinct from Sh Sufism, which is never a political body. If it does, it becomes like the Druze or something like that. But authentic Sufism never crystallizes or ossifies itself in the social structure alone. It's a spiritual inner organization. Gradually, they become distinct. And it's very, very hard to answer your question. For example, the, the imams of Shiism, starting with Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course, also there are the poles of Sufism. Uh, and Imam Jafar al-Sadr, 100 years after the rise of Islam, is the pole of all of the important Sunni, Sunni Sufi orders, even the Naqshbandi, which is a very, very Su Sunni order, Shadali, Qadari, all the great orders. At the same time, the six Shiite imam. So the kind of mixing uh, of the two together is very difficult to distinguish one from the other. But as far as the organized Sufi orders are concerned, they begin first in the Sunni world. Two orders, one in southern Iraq by a man called Sayyid Ahmed al-Rafai, the founder of the order, which is still very, very prevalent, and the other by Persian who migrated to Baghdad, Abdul Qadir Jilani, the founder of the Qadiri order. And those were both Sunni orders. Thank you very much.